and welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. Yeah, I believe this will be a nice uh, session today because it will hopefully give you more intuition, yeah, a bit a little bit deeper understanding of the interest rate models. So we are still in our section on the discrete forward rate term structure model. So if you go back to this picture, which we had very early in the lecture when we defined the different kinds of interest rates, we are in this setup and the interest rate which we are modeling is here these discrete simple forward rates. So the uh, Li, yeah, as a stochastic process. So for every I, I have a separate stochastic process, and this was here our uh, model. So we model Li as an E2 stochastic process. There are the model parameters, initial value, a volatility function, and also a correlation structure. There is an alternative formulation where we say combine the parameters volatility and correlation into a parameter just being the factor loading, so just being a factor in front of independent Brownian motions. So now everyone has here the same vector of Brownian drivers, but with different coefficients. The two are equivalent, and actually this form will become more important later. So what we did is we derived here the drift term on this slide. Yeah, this is here maybe the missing guy. The drift term under the equivalent martingale measure. So that was the der derivation of the drift. And of course, this guy depended on which measure we choose, and that depended on which numeria we choose. So there were two uh, examples, actually three, the terminal measure, the spot measure, the TK uh, forward measure. And in the specification of the numeria, for example, very visible in the specification of the spot numeria, there appears this short period bond. So if simulation time is in little t, the bond that matures at the end of the period. So if this here is our period time discretization and the little t, the simulation time is here, it's the bond that matures here in t m of t plus one and m of t is the starting point, uh, the starting uh, index, the index of the period start. And I would like to discuss this object a little bit. So today it is the short period bond PTMT plus one observed in little t. So there is a defect in our model. If you look back to that formula for the, say, spot measure numeria, then you see that our model describes these stochastic processes here, the LJ, and this is just a special evaluation, LJ observed at the beginning of its period, but our model only describes these stochastic processes and we do not have this short period bond. Yeah. So actually it's not clear what this guy is because our model just describes the evolution of the forward rates. So since this short period bond, so this guy, appears in the definition of the numeria, and it also appears in the definition of the numeria for the terminal measure, I do not have the numeria at time little t 
not being part of my time discretization. So the unspecified short period burn occurs in both numerators. So we call for terminal measure. Maybe it was not so obvious there. The numerator is the bond that matures at the final point in time, the final time discretization point. Okay, but how do you calculate this bond? Yeah, first you move to the end of the current period. Okay, and then you know all the forward rates to move to the final time. So this here is, say, some j from mt plus 1 to n minus 1. And then it's 1 plus lj okay, of little t delta j okay, inverse. Okay. So we do know these objects. These are modeled but we do not know this object. And the same for the spot measure. That one was already on the slide. There it was that the numerator was invest in the short period bond and repeat this investment yeah, by always reinvesting the value of the numerator that you have at the end of the period. So this is just accumulating, accumulating all the forward rates up to the end of the period, mt1 plus LJ. Okay, and now this fixes, yeah, this is special, this fixes then always at the beginning of the period because you do a repeated reinvestment with the forward rate you observe at the beginning of the period. So this is a slight difference, yeah, and there's no to the power of minus one. So because we go forward and here you go backward, it's a minus one. Yeah, you see that it also appears there these guys are known from the model, but this guy is not known. So I have my numerator only at the discretization points because at the discretization point, then this one is known because then it can be represented by just a single forward rate. Yeah, or if you are at the end of the period, yeah, then this becomes equal to one. So the funny thing is that for the modeling of our forward rates, the specification of this short period bond is irrelevant. Okay, so this is a bit strange because um, yeah, the stochastic process, the specification of the LI was just an eto stochastic process, but inside there was the drift and the drift depended on the choice of numeraire. So maybe the drift also depends a little bit on the choice of the model for this short period bond. But when you go back to the derivation of the drift, you will observe that it dropped out. So for the corresponding drift term, it was not relevant to specify this short period bond, you know, since the term canceled. Yeah, the reason was that at this derivation, so when we derived the drift terms, so the derivation of the drift term, what did we do? Yeah, we have built up equations for which we know that the drift is zero that somehow contain the forward rates by looking at the stochastic processes of martingales. So we looked at PTI divided by N for different I's. You know, and this gave us equations for the mu I. Okay, but if you look at the PTI, yeah, how does bond 
that matures in TI depend on the forward rate. Yeah, this is like it is here for the terminal measure, just with a different value here. So this is that we have, so this is go to the end of the current period. Yeah, so I observed this in little t. So go to the index mt plus one. So capital T mt plus one. And then from there, you know the forward rates for your period discretization. So go from mt plus one to, oops, now i minus one. Yeah, i minus one because the last forward rate goes from t i minus one to t i. So it's one plus l j of t delta j inverse. Okay, so maybe as a short reminder, this here is just the bond at the end of the period t j plus one observed in t divided by the bond at the beginning of the period t j observed in t. So you see, this is a telescope product. Yeah, always going from the beginning to the end. So the point is, when we derived the drift by looking at this ratio here, our short period bond is canceling. For example, if you consider terminal measure or if you consider spot measure, it's canceling in both cases. So my condition is only a condition here on the forward rates. And from that, we get a condition on the drift. So it's not needed to specify our short period bond in order to know how the stochastic process of the forward rate looks under our equivalent martingale measure, even if the numerator contains this short period bond in the definition. Yeah, conversely also, our model does not describe the stochastic process of this short period bond. So there's really a gap in the model. So what does this imply? So this implies that we, with the model, can value, for example, a payment in a time point that is on our time discretization. Yeah, why? Because I do know the numerator and evaluating a payment means divide the payment by the numerator in TI, so at payment time and take the expectation. So that's okay. What I cannot do is I cannot evaluate the payment in a time that is not in my time discretization because we do not know the numerator at such a point because this guy is part of the definition and my model, which is just the model here for the LIs, does not specify this. What we can do is look at a fixing of the forward rates at time little t, you know, because we model the stochastic process of these objects. So these objects are known in all times, little t. Okay, this is okay. But payment time yeah, has to lie on the grid because we only know the numerator in t. What we also don't have is A forward rate that starts at some time t s ends in some time t e, uh, starting and end of the period, say fixed in 
little t, so that little t is maybe still okay. But the problem is, if the starting point is not in my time discretization, or the end point is not in my time discretization, then we are lacking this. So the short period bond is creating the link to the continuous time tenors. So this means if you consider that you have a starting time of the period that is not in our time discretization or an end time of the period that is not in our time discretization. And I now consider a forward rate that goes from that time to the end time, that goes from the starting time to the end time. So it is in some sense a fractional forward rate. Okay, so like in this picture, yeah, it starts here in TS and it ends here in TE. So I'm looking now for a period TS to TE, but these guys are not part of our time discretization. Then I do not know this forward rate because what we know is the forward rate for the periods that start on our time discretization and end on our time discretization. Yeah, we can also create the longer period rate periods, yeah, the longer forward rate by just multiplying one plus Li delta I. Yeah, we can create the forward rates that span multiple such intervals, but they have to start and end on the time discretization. So you see that this here is also missing. And we will see that, okay, here it was clear. So here, this guy is also missing because we have not specified the short period bond. Yeah, this is um, easy to see. And this short period bond is really the only missing link to a continuous time model. So a continuous time model, so say uh, he's Jerome Morton, model his Jerome Morton uh, framework like in our picture here. So the guy that models the blue curve instead of here our green curve, it is discretized curve. So this short period bond is the only missing link yeah, to know uh, the shape of the curve in between. Yeah, let's have a look here at these fractional forward rates. So the evolution of our short period bond defines all these fractional forward rates. So to see this first note that it is enough to consider a forward rate that starts at some time capital T, which is not in our time discretization, and it ends, say, on some time Ti plus one that is in our time discretization. We have stochastic processes, so we have these guys for all uh, little t. Uh, so the guy that is missing is a guy that starts in a capital T when capital T is not in our time discretization. Yeah, so not in our time discretization for the T case. So to see this, first note that all forward rates can be decomposed. So this is here now a rate from TS to TE. In my picture here below, it is this long rate starting from, say, TS, which is here, and ending in TE, which is here. 
So that's a general rate starting somewhere in between my period discretization, ending somewhere in between my period discretization. So this guy, well, one plus this interest rate multiplied with the period length is the bond that matures in the starting time divided by the bond that matures in the end time. And now you can decompose this to Ts divided by Ti plus 1, where my Ti plus 1 is just the end of the period where the starting point lies. Then I have Ti plus 1 divided by Tk plus 1. So P of Ti plus 1 divided by P of Tk plus 1. So the bond that pays at the beginning of the, uh, that pays at the end of the period yeah, where the starting point lies in. And the Tk plus 1 is now the end of the period where the end point lies in. Okay, so the Tk plus 1, yeah, so note here the Tk plus 1 is the end point. So I, give, I go a little bit too far, but then I correct this and I just multiply with Tk plus 1, so P of Tk plus 1, divided by P of T. So you see these guys here, yeah, they just uh, cancel. Now it is with that and this with that. Okay, so they just cancel. So I have done nothing wrong. Yeah, I just have put in uh, a few uh, factors. But this here is just determined by the forward rate that goes from Ts to Ti plus 1. So this is just the forward rate that goes from Ts to Ti plus 1. And here in the end, this is the inverse, yeah, so 1 divided by the forward rate that goes from Te to Tk plus 1. So dividing by this means actually you go back. Okay, so you go back this little step. Because here you have gone one period too far. Yeah? So go you go back a little step. But you see the green part is now periods that are within my period discretization, yeah, so forward rates that are within my models. So the queen things are known, and you see it's enough to know a forward rate of this kind here that starts at some arbitrary time but ends on the time discretization. Okay, so hence it is sufficient to know the bond that matures in some capital T divided by the bond that matures at the end of the period where this capital T resides in. And this is our short period bond yeah, if we are in this, this period. So this guy really is given by this short period bond, because what is a bond? Yeah, a zero copper bond is just you pay one unit of currency in capital T. So that's just my universal valuation theorem. Take one divided by the numeraire at payment time. But now remember that we had this nice little lemma that Instead of saying I pay one in capital T, I could also say that I pay one divided by the bond that matures at a later time. For example, at the time discretization point, Tm of capital T plus one, observed in little t. So this is just investing this amount in this bond. Yeah? So investing this amount, one unit in this bond. And then at the end of the period, 
you have one divided by the price of this zero copper bond at the beginning of the investment. And then you pay this at the end of the period that is, you pay this in the time discretization point, capital T M of capital T plus one. So this numerea is now known from our model quantities. Yeah, so this is a function of our LIs. And this object here is just our short period bond. So if you know the stochastic process of this short period bond, so somewhere here in between, of course, then you also know at an earlier time, the zero copper bond that pays one unit at this time. Yeah? So we pay here one unit in capital T. So this means that also for all previous times, our short period bond describes um, the value of this zero copper bond, describes then the value of this ratio here, and then describes the fractional forward rate that we need to build up all fractional forward rates. So the nice thing here is that we can calculate from this definition all fraction forward rates. So this guy specifies the full interest rate curve. Yeah. So note, we need to know it for all times, yeah, all times little t. So it's a trusty process that's running on, yeah, but he is then always filling, filling the gap. An interesting other aspect is that this short period bond, so the T M T plus one, it determines the interpolation of the forward rate. So we've just seen from the previous slide that it determines the forward rate that starts here at some arbitrary point, not in my time discretization and ends on the time discretization. So this means it defines a little bit the interpolation. Yeah? So my model describes how a forward rate on the time discretization looks like. So from TI to TI plus one. So this means my model defines how a bond, you know, what is the value of, the, of a bond that I observe at the beginning of the period that pays at the end of the period. And of course, such a bond has value one at the end. So if you now look at the value of the bond, you know the bond is one at the end of the period. And you also know the value of the bond at the beginning of the period. You know that from your forward rate. But the value in between is maybe some interpolation, could be like that, yeah, could be a straight line. Yeah. So what is what is the shape of this, this bond price in between? And this short period bond by that also defines, of course, the forward rate from such an in-between point, say here to there, to, to there. Yeah, because the forward rate is a kind of a slope yeah, that we uh, observe on the bond prices. So the bond here describes the interpolation of the forward rate. Yeah, first observe this holds here for the case when we just are in little t. Yeah? So we just are in little t, we are just in the period, yeah, and 
now this short period bond yeah is slowly continuing evolving so it defines this forward rate here yeah, just by the this is more or less the defining equation but it also defines this for all earlier times this is just the same argument I did here, huh? so that by now taking the value, the conditional expectation, I can move to an earlier time. So now do the same thing again, but plug in the forward rate. So the forward rate at an earlier time t0 from little t, some point in the future, so say this here is ti plus one, a time discretization point. This is ti. I'm with the little t here. So I have my short period bond for the remaining period here, or I know the fractional forward rate for this period. So we do know here this short period bond. Maybe I make this in the right color here. So that's a pink little t. And now I observe this forward rate at an earlier time, say here. Yeah. So observing means I just take the conditional expectation. By the way, there's a small typo. There should be a conditional expectation with respect to T0 now, of yeah, the bond uh, that pays in little t, the bond, whoops, the bond that pays in little pt, so paying one unit in little t, paying one unit here, is like paying one divided by the short period bond at the end of the period, okay? The forward rate is the bond at the starting time of the period divided by the bond at the end time of the period, the bond at the end time of the period. That guy is on my model discretization. I observe both at some time t0, yeah, so, the PTI plus one bond is okay. The P little t bond is yeah, not okay, but I can express it as a conditional expectation of my short period bond. So this guy here is okay. And the other part is a conditional expectation of the short period bond. So if you now describe the stochastic process of this short period bond, then here by taking the conditional expectation of this stochastic process divided by your numeraire, the numeraire is now on the time discretization, so that guy is also okay, then this gives you the fractional forward rate for this future period, but observed now in T0, so observed now at this earlier point in time. So if I go back to this picture here, yeah, by the way, that's also nice here. You can replace, of course, this short period bond by the forward rate again here. Yeah, so it's one divided by the bond. So because of that, it is one plus the forward rate from the little t observed in the little t to the end time the ti plus one, and then it is the forward rate for the remaining period. So the remaining period is here, of course, just from ti to, uh, to oops, wait, this is, uh, this is wrong. Oops, there's a typo, sorry. It is the remaining period. So this is the period from little t to ti plus one. Okay. Yeah, if you go then back to our picture that we had very early in the lecture, you see that 
this short period bond also describes here the interpolation. Yeah? So it describes actually this blue curve, yeah, the interpolation inside of the period of our forward rate. Okay. Um, of course, there is a close relation to this uh, um, of this short period bond to our short rate. So maybe you recall here, this is the short rate, and the short rate is just a single stochastic process yeah, that runs along, yeah, and actually the drift of the stochastic process, the drift of the short rate is such that it creates the shape, the interpolation of the interest rate curve. Yeah, speaking of drift, this is now yeah, maybe the last uh, part to this short period bond. What is the drift of this object? For our forward rates, we had to derive the drift of the forward rate under our equivalent martingale measure. And now comes a little surprising effect here, yeah? maybe also a little bit enlightening. Within our model, there is no drift condition for the short period bond. So the no is missing here. <laughs> okay, so there appears to be no constraint. So that's the important part here on the drift of our PTMT plus one. Uh -huh. This is buggy a little bit today, yeah? So there's a T here, of course, inside. And these guys copy-paste errors. Um, yeah, why is this the case? Well, because this thing is part of our numeraire, the thing is that this bond divided by my numeraire is always a martingale because it cancels out. So there appears to be no constraint on the drift, but I will have a small warning below. And this relative price is always a martingale, regardless of the model you choose for this short period bond, because it is canceling out. So this is a little bit the numeraire divided by the numeraire is always a martingale. Yeah, numeraire divided by numeraire is one. And there's also the, the little trick that is hidden in the risk-neutral valuation theorem when you move to um, the equivalent martingale measure. What you do is you look at relative prices. Price is divided by the numeraire, and then you use the martingale representation theorem. And there also the phi zero in your replication portfolio was a free parameter because the differential in the martingale representation theorem of the numeraire divided by the numeraire is, is zero. Yeah? So regardless what you have in your phi zero um, in the martingale representation theorem, it does not pop up. And that was the trick that allowed us to create the replication portfolio self-financing. So it's maybe not a surprise yeah, that there is an asset that has this degree of freedom, so for which we do not have a drift condition. And of course, this asset is the numeraire itself. So maybe it is surprising, but this appeared before. For example, in the Black-Scholes model, the drift of the stock is determined by the condition that stock divided by my numeraire is a martingale, but the drift of B, the R, the interest rate, is a free parameter. Yeah? It is a model parameter because it is the drift of the numeraire. And the same is valid, for example, for a short rate model. In a short rate model, the drift is a free parameter. 
So let's go back to this picture. So everything is linked now. Remember that short rate models, yeah? So if you already know short rate models, maybe you uh, remember that. If not, we have a small discussion later. But in a short rate model, the drift is a free parameter. And actually this drift of a short rate model is generating the shape of the interest rate curve we observe today because the drift is chosen such that the stochastic process follows a little bit this, this shape. Yeah? Of course, if the stochastic process move, moves on, it can be that the curve has moved yeah, and will then again follow the new, new shape. But these are now conditional expectations. If you take the unconditional expectation, yeah, the short rate process generates by its drift the shape of the curve. And that's exactly the same effect why our short period bond generates this interpolation, because it is this guy. You can also rewrite it as in terms of the short rate. So this is an interesting object and hopefully, yeah, now you know what it is. Yeah? It is the missing guy that generates the interpolation in the periods in between. But if you go back to my initial slide here, even if we have a model that does not specify this guy, there are a lot of things which we can already do. We can value all payments on the time discretizations and we have yeah, fixings of well, a decent, yeah, a quite large set of forward rates. So that slide started with the claim that there appears to be no constraint on the drift. The drift is a free parameter. Uh, and by that, we generate this interpolation. But note, there is a warning. The drift is the guy that determines the interpolation of the forward rates. You see this very easily if you assume, say, for simplicity, that this short period bond is deterministic. Yeah? So this deterministic means now assume that it has no DW. If you specify it as an ETO process. Then if it is deterministic, you can just write it as an ODE. So the change of this short period bond is just DP by DT times DT. So this is trivial. Yeah, you in, just integrate the uh, differential you know, to get the function with an initial condition. And the initial condition is that if I start on my time discretization, then it is just the forward rate observed at the beginning of the period from the beginning of the period to the end of the period. So I have some kind of initial condition. You also have an end condition. The end condition is that the bond is one in the end. So it's maybe much nicer to model the forward rate and not the bond. Yeah, but then you see that the shape of this function yeah, is just here determined by the drift. Yeah. So the drift is a free parameter and this free parameter determines the shape of my interpolation. Yeah. So I have the picture again. Yeah. So this is here my T mt plus one. If this T here is in between, so maybe we start here. So I know that the bond is one in the end, and I also know the initial value here. And now I have my ODE that pre-scribes here some slope. And this slope, of course, determines the shape of the function in between. Yeah? So the drift determines this interpolation. The interpolation of the short period bond determines the interpolation of the forward rate. And there is the small warning. Uh, we have, of course, a subtle consistency condition. When we start with an interest rate curve, 
we recall our session on interest rate curves, and this curve is already having some kind of special interpolation. Yeah, log of the bond price curve is interpolated linearly. So recall, we could specify there an interpolation. Then, of course, what our stochastic model creates as an interpolation of the interest rate curve should be uh, consistent with our interpolation that we have for the initial values. So if you use a model with curves, say for swaps, to model this analytically, to, to value this analytically using the curves, and these have a certain interpolation, then maybe here the interpolation you create by specifying this short period bond should be consistent. Well, if you just would like to see one possible interpolation, if you have here this assumption that the bond is deterministic, you could just create any nice deterministic function that interpolates here the starting value and the end value. For example, I could just take a constant extrapolation of the forward rate. So taking a constant extrapolation of the forward rate would mean that I just use the forward rate that I observe at the beginning of the period and now my period becomes smaller and smaller. So, you know, I have the fractional period starting in little t, ending in t plus one. So I just multiply with this smaller time period length. Yeah. And then just say, okay, one divided by one plus this is then um, the bond price, the zero copa bond price for the bond that matures at the end of the period. This is a special kind of interpolation, but this is a possible specification of this short period bond. And you see now you are specifying this short period bond in terms of stochastic processes that are part of my model. Yeah? So I could use, use uh, this and um, you can also then derive that this is a special version of the heath morton framework yeah, where the uh, volatility matrix has um, yeah, a certain special shape sh shortly before the maturity. Yeah? The volatility becomes zero. Um, this interpolation is not so good. Yeah? If you think of our session on curve interpolation, um, maybe a good interpolation is to have a linear interpolation of the logarithm of the Cobra bond prices. So this here is not a log linear interpolation. Maybe a nice alternative would be a log linear interpolation of the short period bond, yeah? interpolating with here the starting value and the end value. Mm -hmm. So, but the starting value is given by our forward rate, yeah, which is part generated by the model, which is part of the model. So this would complete our model. Now that was a session on the short period bond.